Chapter 14 Concerning the Ten Modes The usual tradition amongst the older skeptics is that the modes by which suspension is supposed to be brought about are ten in number, and they also give them the synonymous names of arguments and positions. They are these, the first based on the variety in animals, the second on the differences in human beings, the third on the different structures of the organs of sense, the fourth on the circumstantial conditions, the fifth on positions and intervals and locations, the sixth on intermixtures, the seventh on the quantities and formation of the underlying objects, the eighth on the fact of relativity, the ninth on the frequency or rarity of occurrence, the tenth on the disciplines and customs and laws, the legendary beliefs and the dogmatic convictions. This order, however, we adopt without prejudice. As superordinate to these, there stand three modes, that based on the subject who judges, that on the object judged, and that based on both. The first four of the ten modes are subordinate to the mode based on the subject, for the subject which judges is either an animal or a man or a sense and existent in some condition. The seventh and tenth modes are referred to that based on the object judged. The fifth, sixth, eighth, and ninth are referred to the mode based on both subject and object. Furthermore, these three modes are also referred to that of relation, so that the mode of relation stands as the highest genus, and the three as species, and the ten as subordinate subspecies. If we give this as the probable account of their numbers, and as to their argumentative force, what we say is this. The first argument, or trope, as we said, is that which shows that the same impressions are not produced by the same objects, owing to the differences in animals. This we infer both from the differences in their origins and from the variety of their bodily structures. Thus, as to origin, some animals are produced without sexual union, others by coition. And of those produced without coition, some come from fire, like the animalcules which appear in furnaces, and others from putrid water, like gnats, others from wine when it turns sour, like ants, others from earth, like grasshoppers, others from marsh, like frogs, others from mud, like worms, others from asses, like beetles, others from greens, like caterpillars, others from fruits, like the gall insects in wild figs, others from rotting animals, as bees from bulls, or wasps from horses. Of the animals generated by coition, some, in fact the majority, come from homogeneous parents, others from heterogeneous parents, as do mules, Again, of animals in general, some are born alive like men, others are born as eggs like birds, and yet others as lumps of flesh like bears. It is natural, then, that these dissimilar and variant modes of birth should produce much contrariety of sense affection, and that this is a source of its divergent, discordant, and conflicting character. Moreover, the differences found in the most important parts of the body, and especially in those of which the natural function is judging and perceiving, are capable of producing a vast deal of divergence in the sense impressions, owing to the variety in the animals. Thus sufferers from jaundice declare that objects which seem to us white are yellow, while those whose eyes are bloodshot call them blood red. Since then, some animals also have eyes which are yellow, others bloodshot, others albino, others of other colors. They probably, I suppose, have different perceptions of color. Moreover, if we bend down over a book after having gazed long and fixedly at the sun, the letters seem to us to be golden in color and circling round. Since then, some animals possess also a natural brilliance in their eyes, and emit from them a fine and mobile stream of light, so that they can even see by night, we seem bound to suppose that they are differently affected from us by external objects. 
jugglers too, by means of smearing lamp wicks with the rust of copper or with the juice of the cuttlefish, make the bystanders appear now copper-colored and now black, and that by just a small sprinkling of extra matter. Surely, then, we have much more reason to suppose that when different juices are intermingled in the vision of animals, their impressions of the objects will become different. Again, when we press the eyeball at one side, the forms, figures, and sizes of the objects appear oblong and narrow. So it is probable that all animals which have the pupil of the eye slanting and elongated, such as goats, cats, and similar animals, have impressions of the objects which are different and unlike the notions formed of them by the animals which have round pupils. Mirrors, too, owing to differences in their construction, represent the external objects at one time as very small as when the mirror is concave, at another time as elongated and narrow as when the mirror is convex. Some mirrors, too, show the head of the figure reflected at the bottom and the feet at the top. Since then, some organs of sight actually protrude beyond the face owing to their convexity, while others are quite concave and others again lie in a level plane. On this account also it is probable that their impressions differ, and that the same objects as seen by dogs, fishes, lions, men, and locusts are neither equal in size nor similar in shape, but vary according to the image of each object created by the particular sight that receives the impression. Of the other sense organs also the same account holds good. Thus, in respect of touch, how could one maintain that creatures covered with shells, with flesh, with prickles, with feathers, with scales, are all similarly affected? And as for the sense of hearing, how could we say that its perceptions are alike in animals with a very narrow auditory passage and those with a very wide one, or in animals with hairy ears and those with smooth ears? For as regards this sense, even we ourselves find our hearing affected in one way when we have our ears plugged, and in another when we use them just as they are. Smell also will differ because of the variety in animals. For if we ourselves are affected in one way when we have a cold and our internal phlegm is excessive, and in another way when the parts about our head are filled with an excess of blood, feeling an aversion to smells which seem sweet to everyone else and regarding them as noxious, it is reasonable to suppose that animals too, since some are flaccid by nature and rich in phlegm, others rich in blood, others marked by a predominant excess of yellow or black gall, are in each case impressed in different ways by the objects of smell. So too with the objects of taste, for some animals have rough and dry tongues, others extremely moist tongues. We ourselves, too, when our tongues are very dry in cases of fever, think the food proffered us to be earthy and ill-flavored or bitter an affection due to the variation in the predominating juices which we are said to contain. Since then, animals also have rich organs of taste, which differ and which have different juices in excess. In respect of taste, also they will receive different impressions of the real objects. For just as the same food when digested becomes in one place a vein, in another an artery, in another a bone, in another a sinew, or some other piece of the body, displaying a different potency according to the difference in the parts which receive it, and just as the same unblended water, when it is absorbed by trees, becomes in one place bark, in another branch, in another blossom, and so finally fig and quince, and each of the other fruits, and just as the single identical breath of a musician breathed into a flute becomes here a shrill note, and there a deep note, and the same pressure of his hand on the lyre produces here a deep note, and there a shrill note, so likewise it is probable that the external objects appear different owing to differences in the structure of the animals which experience the sense impressions. But one may learn this more clearly, from the preferences and aversions of animals. Thus sweet oil seems very agreeable to men, but intolerable to beetles and bees. And olive oil is beneficial to men, 
but when poured on wasps and bees it destroys them. And sea water is a disagreeable and poisonous potion for men, but fish drink and enjoy it. Pigs, too, enjoy wallowing in the most stinking mire rather than in clear and clean water. And whereas some animals eat grass, others eat shrubs, others feed in woods, others live on seeds or flesh or milk, some of them, too, prefer their food high, others like it fresh, and while some prefer it raw, others like it cooked. And so generally, the things which are agreeable to some are to others disagreeable and distasteful and deadly. Thus quails are fattened by hemlock and pigs by henbane, and pigs also enjoy eating salamanders, just as deer enjoy poisonous creatures and swallows gnats. So ants and woodlice, when swallowed by men, cause distress and gripings, whereas the bear, whenever she falls sick, cures herself by licking them up. The mere touch of an oak twig paralyzes the viper, and that of a plain leaf the bat. The elephant flees from the ram, the lion from the cock, sea monsters from the crackle of bursting beans, and the tiger from the sound of a drum. One might indeed cite many more examples, but not to seem unduly prolix, if the same things are displeasing to some but pleasing to others, and pleasure and displeasure depend upon sense impression, then animals receive different impressions from the underlying objects. But if the same things appear different owing to the variety in animals, we shall indeed be able to state our own impressions of the real object. But as to its essential nature, we shall suspend judgment. For we cannot ourselves judge between our own impressions and those of other animals, since we ourselves are involved in the dispute and are, therefore, rather in need of a judge than competent to pass judgment ourselves. Besides, we are unable, either with or without proof, to prefer our own impressions to those of the irrational animals. For in addition to the probability that proof is, as we shall show, a non-entity, the so-called proof itself will be either apparent to us or non-apparent. If then it is non-apparent, we shall not accept it with confidence. While if it is apparent to us, inasmuch as what is apparent to animals is the point in question, and the proof is apparent to us who are animals, it follows that we shall have to question the proof itself as to whether it is as true as it is apparent. It is indeed absurd to attempt to establish the matter in question by means of the matter in question, since in that case the same thing will be at once believed and disbelieved, believed in so far as it purports to prove, but disbelieved in so far as it requires proof, which is impossible. Consequently, we shall not possess a proof which enables us to give our own sense impressions the preference over those of the so-called irrational animals. If then, owing to the variety in animals, their sense impressions differ, and it is impossible to judge between them, we must necessarily suspend judgment regarding the external underlying objects. By way of superaddition, too, we draw comparisons between mankind and the so-called irrational animals in respect of their sense impressions. For after our solid arguments, we deem it quite proper to poke fun at those conceited braggarts, the dogmatists. As a rule, our school compare the irrational animals in the mass with mankind, but since the dogmatists captiously assert that the comparison is unequal, we, superadding yet more, will carry our ridicule further and base our argument on one animal only, the dog, for instance, if you like, which is held to be the most worthless of animals. For even in this case, we shall find that the animals we are discussing are no wise inferior ourselves in respect of the credibility of their impressions. Now it is allowed by the dogmatists that this animal, the dog, excels us in point of sensation. As to smell, it is more sensitive than we are, since by this sense 
it tracks beasts that it cannot see, and with its eyes it sees them more quickly than we do, and with its ears it is keen of perception. Next, let us proceed to the reasoning faculty. Of reason, one kind is internal, implanted in the soul, the other externally expressed. Let us consider first the internal reason. Now, according to those dogmatists who are at present our chief opponents, I mean the Stoics, internal reason is supposed to be occupied with the following matters. The choice of things congenial and the avoidance of things alien, the knowledge of the arts contributing thereto, the apprehension of the virtues pertaining to one's proper nature, and of those relating to the passions. Now the dog, the animal upon which, by way of example, we have decided to base our argument, exercises choice of the congenial and avoidance of the harmful, in that it hunts after food and slinks away from the raised whip. Moreover, it possesses an art which supplies what is congenial, namely hunting. Nor is it devoid even of virtue, for certainly if justice consists in rendering to each his due, the dog that welcomes and guards its friends and benefactors but drives off strangers and evildoers cannot be lacking in justice. But if he possesses this virtue, then since the virtues are interdependent, he possesses also all other virtues, and these, say the philosophers, the majority of men do not possess. That the dog is also valiant we see by the way he repels attacks, and intelligent as well, as Homer too testified, when he sang how Odysseus went unrecognized by all the people of his own household, and was recognized only by the dog Argus, who neither was deceived by the bodily alterations of the hero, nor had lost his original apprehensive impression, which indeed he evidently retained better than the men. And, according to Chrysippus, who shows special interest in irrational animals, the dog even shares in the far-famed dialectic. This person, at any rate, declares that the dog makes use of the fifth complex indemonstrable syllogism when on arriving at a spot where three ways meet after smelling at the two roads by which the quarry did not pass he rushes off at once by the third without stopping to smell for says the old writer the dog implicitly reasons thus the creature went either by this road or by that or by the other but it did not go by this road or by that, therefore, it went by the other. Moreover, the dog is capable of comprehending and assuaging his own sufferings. For when a thorn has got stuck in his foot, he hastens to remove it by rubbing his foot on the ground and by using his teeth. And if he has a wound anywhere, because dirty wounds are hard to cure, whereas clean ones heal easily, the dog gently licks off the pus that has gathered. Nay more, the dog admirably observes the prescription of Hippocrates, rest being what cures the foot. Whenever he gets his foot hurt, he lifts it up and keeps it as far as possible free from pressure. And when distressed by unwholesome humors, he eats grass, by the help of which he vomits what is unwholesome and gets well again. If then, it has been shown that the animal upon which, as an example, we have based our argument, not only chooses the wholesome and avoids the noxious, but also possesses an art capable of supplying what is wholesome, and is capable of comprehending and assuaging its own sufferings, and is not devoid of virtue. Then, these being the things in which the perfection of internal reason consists, the dog will be thus far perfect. And that, I suppose, is why certain of the professors of philosophy have adorned themselves with the title of this animal. Concerning external reason or speech, it is unnecessary for the present to inquire, 
for it has been rejected even by some of the dogmatists as being a hindrance to the acquisition of virtue, for which reason they used to practice silence during the period of instruction. And besides, supposing that a man is dumb, no one will therefore call him irrational. But to pass over these cases, we certainly see animals, the subject of our argument, uttering quite human cries, jays, for instance, and others. And leaving this point also aside, even if we do not understand the utterances of the so-called irrational animals, still it is not improbable that they converse, although we fail to understand them. For in fact, when we listen to the talk of barbarians, we do not understand it, and it seems to us a kind of uniform chatter. Moreover, we hear dogs uttering one sound when they are driving people off, another when they are howling, and one sound when beaten, and quite another different sound when fawning. And so in general, in the case of all other animals as well as the dog, whoever examines the matter carefully will find a great variety of utterances according to the different circumstances, so that in consequence the so-called irrational animals may justly be said to participate in external reason. But if they neither fall short of mankind in the accuracy of their perceptions, nor in internal reason, nor yet to still go further in external reason or speech, then they will deserve no less credence than ourselves in respect of their sense impressions. Probably, too, we may reach the conclusion by basing our arguments on each single class of irrational animals. Thus, for example, who would deny that birds excel in quickness of wit, or that they employ external reason? For they understand not only present events, but future events as well, and these they foreshow to such as are able to comprehend them by means of prophetic cries, as well as by other signs. I have drawn this comparison, as I previously indicated, by way of superaddition, having already sufficiently proved, as I think, that we cannot prefer our own sense impressions to those of the irrational animals. If, however, the irrational animals are not less worthy of credence than we in regard to the value of sense impressions, and their impressions vary according to the variety of animal, then, although I shall be able to say what the nature of each of the underlying objects appears to me to be, I shall be compelled for the reasons stated above to suspend judgment as to its real nature. Such, then, is the first of the modes which induces suspense.